Guys, welcome back to Unpopular Opinion. And before we get into the topic of the day, I want to issue an apology. I haven't uploaded in a while, and reason being, my last video, Star Wars Attack of the Clones was a good movie, was a nightmare to make. Not only did it take a long time to write, record, and edit, but I had a lot of trouble uploading due to copyright, and I uploaded it only to take it down probably 20 times, and it was a nightmare. So, I needed to take a break, you know, because a lot of time and energy goes into making these videos, and sometimes it gets very overwhelming, so I'm very sorry for that, but I'm back, and now let's get into it. Guys, we're on the precipice of the unknown, because what I'm attempting to do is something I've never done. Now, I've talked about a few of the same movies in a couple videos, but I've never retouched on a film I've already reviewed to review it again. Now, if you don't know, when I first started this segment on my channel, one of my earliest videos was about the good, the bad, and the ugly, and I basically just made brief overview about things of stuff I didn't really like and my thoughts on it, but I didn't really get into depth and details as to why I thought that way. Not just that, but being that I was really new to YouTube at the time, I felt like I could have just done better. Not just on that video, but a few others. Reason being that the audio was terrible, the video quality could have been better, and I really fumbled with my words and stammered a bit. But, my fellow movie lovers, I recently rewatched the movie after a very long time, and I kind of see things a little differently. So let's get into it. The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly is an epic spaghetti western that's the final installment of the Dollars Trilogy, also known as the Man With No Name Trilogy. The film features three title characters. The Good, The Man With No Name, <coughs> The Bad, Angel Eyes, <coughs> and The Ugly Tuco. The Man With No Name, aka The Good, is my all-time favorite movie character. I've mentioned that so many times in numerous videos. He's a bounty hunter gunslinger who's a wizard with his pistol and is tough as nails. The last thing you want to do is cross him, or you'll be sorry. His presence alone is so commanding and dominant. He's the ultimate man, and his moral ambiguity just makes the mysterious drifter so much more dangerous and awesome. Angel Eyes, aka The Bad, is a hitman assassin who always sees the job through when he's paid. And Tuco, aka The Ugly, is a Mexican bandit. He's feisty and has a big mouth. That's the best way to describe him. He just doesn't shut up. So the course of the movie unfolds like this. It's 1862 during the American Civil War of the New Mexico campaign. Angel Eyes is hired to track down Bill Carson. Bill Carson disappeared with a mysterious cash box that's gone missing. Angel Eyes pulls out all the stops to find him and the money. He finds out that Carson wears an eye patch and re-enlisted in the Confederate Army, so he goes after him. Meanwhile, the man with no name and Tuco are partners in crime. The man with no name hands Tuco to the authorities to collect the reward money on him, since Tuco is a very wanted outlaw. And when he's about to get hung, the man with no name saves him, he rescues him so they can split the reward money. And they repeat this process over and over, but the relationship starts to strain. Tuco says he's the one risking his life, so he should get more than half of the reward money. But the man with no name says, well, I saved your life, and I'm not giving up my share. And this causes tension. And after one of their schemes where the man with no name almost misses shooting the noose, Tuco and him bicker during the getaway. The man with no name reasons that there's no future in their partnership, and he's going separate ways. He leaves Tuco tied up in the desert and takes all the money. And by some miracle, Tuco manages to walk 70 miles out of the desert to civilization. He gets a gun, he gets a posse, and he tracks down the man with no name to get revenge. But the man with no name kills the posse, and somehow Tuco gets the jump on him and tries to force him to hang himself. But the good escapes. Tuco hunts him down again and disarms him. He forces the man with no name to do a death march into the desert as torture. And after miles of walking in the harsh, unforgiving landscape, he collapses out of exhaustion and overexposure to the sun. Right as Tuco's about to kill him, a Confederate wagon passes by and inside is the dying Bill Carson. Carson reveals to Tuco that he buried $200,000 of gold in Sad Hill Cemetery in one of the graves. Before he can divulge the name on the grave, he passes out. Tuco tries to give him water, but returns to find Carson dead, and the man with no name is right beside him. The man tells Tuco in Carson's dying breath. He told him the name on the grave. Now realizing that he needs the good alive, he dresses them both up in uniforms of the dead Confederate soldiers in the wagon and takes them to an old Spanish mission where the brothers give medical treatment to any Civil War soldier there. The good recovers, and that's basically when the main plot of the movie begins. Each of the three title characters knows a piece of the puzzle to get the money. They all distrust each other, and they're willing to double-cross each other at any opportunity they get. And in every man's struggle for a quest of the jackpot. So right off the bat, let's address my previous video. Actually, I should have said this earlier, but you should probably check that out before watching this. I'll leave a link in the description below. Anyway, 
I have changed my mind slightly about the movie, but in my previous video, I stated that the movie wasn't that good, and it's my least favorite out of the trilogy. I do want to say that as a movie, it's a good one. And that's the thing I changed my mind on. It's actually a good movie, but it's still my least favorite out of the Man With No Name trilogy. My rankings of the movies from best to worst are Fistful of Dollars for a few dollars more, then at the bottom is The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. So, when I rewatched the film, I came to realize that it's actually one of the most beautifully and well put together films. The direction by Sergio Leone was perfect. Anywhere from its cinematography, camera work, art direction, special effects, stunt work, dialogue or lack thereof, set pieces, characters, stories, I can go on forever honestly, but when you look at how the movie was crafted, you see how much effort went into the making of it. One of my favorite aspects of the film is the camera work. I love how it's like the perfect combination of trying to keep up with the characters and also being two steps ahead of them. And not just that, but there's instances of brilliance behind the camera. Just to name a few that I personally love, the scene where the man with no name is lying on the bed incapacitated and he opens his eyes to look at Tuco and it's a first person point of view shot. It's all blurry and out of focus. Then little by little, there's more clarity in the shot. I thought that was brilliant. Maybe shots like that today are a dime a dozen, but for then and the technology they had, I think it looked really good. Another bit of camera work I really liked was during the death march in the desert. There's a brief shot of Clint Eastwood walking and stumbling, obviously having trouble, and the camera is like shaky and fumbly and mirroring his actions. And I thought that was really cool. It was a unique visual insight into the condition of our protagonist, and it spoke volumes of how he was suffering and having a difficult time continuing. It's the subtle stuff like that, like the small details that were given more attention that really stood out. And to continue off of that, what I really like about Sergio Leone's directing style in the movie was when he makes a big scene or crafts a huge sequence and there's little details he wants the audience to see, he'll make sure that we see them. You know, there's a lot of movies I can think of off the top of my head where the small details, not quite Easter eggs, but small things that have relevance or importance to the plot or the scene that directors kind of just expect you to see. And they're easy to miss and it takes away from the importance or the tone perhaps. The biggest example from another movie for me personally is the scene in Platoon where Charlie Sheen's character survives the battle and he's found by other soldiers. You see him crouching, he's all disheveled and clearly traumatized. And a small detail that the director kind of expects the audience to pick up on is Charlie Sheen's about to commit suicide. He's holding a grenade, he's about to pull the pin, and when he's found he changes his mind and he drops it. Which in all of my viewings of watching that film, and that's a lot by the way, I've never noticed that until that was pointed out when I watched the DVD commentary. It's things like that. It changes stuff. So I like how Sergio Leone doesn't want any of that important stuff to be missed. A few examples of that, like off the top of my head, would be the scene where the commandant of the prisoner of war camp is looking through a telescope. He's scanning around the camp and checking it out. And the director, he could have just as easily did an aerial view or a wide shot showing the camp, but no. He condensed the view of the audience to showcase not only what the character was looking at, but the more important details of the surroundings, like the prisoners just coming in, the ruthless guards and their defenses, and the security measures, and plus our main characters. Or the scene where the man with no name and angel eyes are sleeping, and we get a sweeping shot of him laying down from his feet to his head. We hear something's approaching from off camera, then he quickly pans down to his gun, and that's basically just showing how the man with no name is aware of his surroundings, and that the audience, we the audience, we're getting prepared to witness his reaction, which is to draw and fire his weapon. It's like the stuff like that, that really makes a detail-heavy movie, but not in an over-the-top kind of a way, and it's not overdone, it's not crafted in a way that it's like just shoving it in your face, or it's just trying too hard to be extra artsy or unnecessary. And another thing that I thought was really cool is, this is a really small detail, but the fact of the matter is the good, the bad, and the ugly, they're, the only time they're ever really on screen together is at the ending scene. And I just thought that was so cool. Like, there are times of the movie where they all meet together at once, like the Civil War camp, but Sergio Leone was just really careful to, to not show them all in the same frame until the iconic ending. And I just, I just thought that was really cool. And it's not far-fetched to say that Leone pioneered the intense close-ups and the extreme editing pace with his unique style of directing. It's highly amusing and it's very beautiful to watch. It's not necessarily unique to this movie as he uses this trademark style in many of the films, but I loved it. And last but certainly not least, the music. I always call John Williams the emperor of movie music, and he certainly is, but Ennio Morricone is easily the runner-up. So before many people jump to the comments and say, John Williams didn't work on this movie, yeah, I know. I'm just making a comparison between the two Academy Award winning film music composers. So anyway, John Williams makes amazing, beautiful music for the films that require great scores and catchy theme songs. But when you hire Ennio Morricone, you get the whole package. He not only delivers great scores and makes lasting theme songs, but 
His music is truly the best for setting the tone and setting the emotional atmosphere that is required from things unfolding on screen, be that tension, anxiety, action, heroism, or sorrow. It's amazing. In fact, the director was so amazed with the work by Marconi that he edited the film in accordance with the musical scores. Unlike the standard practice of the composer, he, you know, scoring the movie <laughs> due to the final cut. I thought that was just a really interesting fact. And I don't know many composers that can create an intense emotional atmosphere on screen with minimal events just <laughs> happening. Like the scene where Angel is at Steven's house. He just dismounts his horse, and he walks closer to the camera, but the subtle music slowly gets louder and louder, and you could tell from the music alone, like, yep, he's a bad guy. Then, the final scene, where Tuco's in the noose being left for dead, those poundings on the drums, like, very, very much reminiscent of Tuco's heartbeat, like, slowly getting more intense, and that makes the scene so much more epic and impactful. So, it really is the full package, and as I've said before, and I'll say it again, the theme song for the good, the bad, and the ugly is like the national anthem for the Wild West. It's so mega ultra iconic. Even if you've never seen the movie itself, you've heard the music. And not just the main theme, but the ecstasy of gold. That's another iconic song. It's basically the song you hear in all those like beer commercials. You 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 know the song by sound, but not by name. <laughs> Not for nothing, the plot in and of itself is pretty clever. It's a very original story and very cool. And I thought many parts of the story were written very well. You know, like, it's probably the most realistic story out of the Dollars trilogy. And a thing that I, I have huge respect for is the fact that this movie doesn't resort to using profanity to command its seriousness. Like, I know some minor curse words were used. And, like, sometimes there were some bad words. But overall, it's minimal. Like, in nowadays when you watch movies, I think writers and filmmakers rely on cursing and swearing to create, like, intensity or vigor for its scenes to get, like, more explicit content across to its audiences. Now... There's absolutely nothing wrong with that, but whenever I watch period pieces and I, I hear the characters just swearing up a storm like in 1917 Titanic or 310 to Yuma, I always feel like people of those ages didn't really talk like that or there was more dignity in people's vocabulary, unlike in today's world. So when I see the characters of another time period talking like we do, it's really unusual. Do you kiss your mother with that mouth? Well, sometimes, but not recently. But I love how this movie doesn't resort to that. Like, it maintained and gained its seriousness through amazing performances, impactful dialogue, without needing to resort to cursing, which made it more powerful and poignant. It's unfortunate, but you don't see that in movies nowadays. And lastly, before I get into the meat and potatoes of the video, I just want to pay homage to the practical and special effects used throughout the movie. It's incredible. And the stunt work, oh my god. Like, when you look, sh you look at shots like this, it's like, you literally say to yourself, how the hell did they film that? I think the stunts and the explosions and the special effects were just phenomenal. So with all those positives about the film, I feel like a hipster saying it, but they really don't make them like they used to. So needless to say that the legacy of this film has left a lasting impact around the world. Like I've said it before, this film is so mega iconic and well known that you'd have to be living under a rock to have never heard about this movie or know any references to it. It's absolutely responsible for making Clint Eastwood into an international star. But now for the negative part of the review. As previously stated, this is my least favorite of the Dollars trilogy for many reasons. First and foremost is the fact that I think they downgraded the man with no name so much in this movie that it kind of derailed his badassery of his character. Not just that, but he was second banana in his own movie. Then there's the fact that the overall plot of the movie was overshadowed by the Civil War and the Western aspect of the movie took a backseat to make room for the more emotional anti-war dramatics. 